We are live now. We can start. Yes. Mega, shall we? Good afternoon, everyone. We are at the end of the three day international multidisciplinary symposium, open pages in South Asia's Asian Studies 4 on the theme, the contemporary dynamics of South Asia. We are privileged to have Mr. Kumar Ketkar, a senior journalist and a member of Rajya Sabha for the valedictory address. To begin with this valedictory session, Dr. Sharad Navre will present the report of the symposium. Dr. Sharad Navre is a former associate professor of theoretical physics from Shivaji University. He has also worked as a head and member of various significant bodies in the university. Besides being a scientist and teacher by profession, he has contributed to the field of translation of world literature from many languages with a range of writers and poets, such as Samuel Beckett, Gabriel Emmanuel, Rumi, and several modern Hindi poets. I request Dr. Sharad Navre to present the report of the three-day symposium. Thank you, Aranduti. Uh, the current symposium has been so vast in scope. It has touched so many uh, aspects of South Asia that uh, uh, I feel personally quite enriched uh, on hearing this. The other impression is, of course, uh, that all of us in South Asia are now facing similar problems. Now, that is something uh, uh, I have to digest. And uh, that is something which will teach us certain le uh, lessons, politically, sociologically, economically, in all respects. Now, uh, let me get down to the business. Uh, that is the report of this symposium. I'll go day by day and uh, if time permits, session by session. On the first day in the inaugural session, director of Russian house in Mumbai gave her warm wishes for success of the symposium. Director of the symposium and head of Department of Foreign Languages, Dr. Megha, narrated briefly the history of department and the activities undertaken. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor D. T. Shirke, who was in the chair, welcomed the online speakers and participants to the symposium. The inaugural talk was some thoughts on the society we want. It was given by Professor Emeritus of uh, History and world-renowned historian, Professor Romila Thapar. She began with a very pertinent question, whether we achieve what we had set, to, set out to achieve at the time of independence in the last 75 years. She reminded us that ours was a sovereign, democratic, secular state, and it was only the constitution of the country which can keep it so. The problem of protecting democracy and secularism was not limited to India alone, but many nations are beset by it. She mentioned the three arms of democracy, namely legislature, the executive, and judiciary, and asked whether we have succeeded in uh, protecting the autonomy of these during the last 75 years. She was of the opinion that the awareness of citizens' rights and freedom of expression were of utmost importance to protect democracy. Again, she insisted that no category of citizens should have a priority over others, irrespective of historical practice or what is projected as cultural heritage or described as religion of majority. She categorically stated that the identities are not fixed one and uh, for all these they change with time.
the second uh, lecture that is the uh, was by professor ganesh devi that was the keynote address for the symposium he pointed out that south asians constitute a quarter of humanity but are jam packed only on 3.5% of the land surface this region is a mu museum of humanity and we should preserve it in the form of a civilized society he talked about the freedom in index which consists of three components namely personal economic and human freedoms he provided us with some statistics on the position of south asian countries in the global ranking index of these parameters this reflects on the governance of these countries the main occupation of the south asians uh, has been agriculture but most of these countries have crossed a line beyond which agriculture is no longer a healthy way of life uh, it is being utterly threatened and devastated for want of proper education of course he talked about uh, democracy here i suppose and uh, uh, the population in the villages is move, is moving to urban places and having completely uh, and ha have formed completely chaotic urban centers the population is seen as floundering and flee floating their proprietorship has no parallel in human history and is without any hope of recovery he said that he was mentioning this not for the sake of negativity and depression but for rethinking as a south asian uh, with rethinking of south asia with a greater uh, clarity he appealed for abandonment of colonization viewpoint that which looks to south asia only from the utilitarian point of view perhaps only as uh, warring countries the perspective for ourselves should be developed by ourselves south asia is a mix of different cultures of tolerance of ability to enter into dialogues to shape new language and to preserve the old ones he said that languages world over are dying fast but south asians have kept this trend in check this peculiar phenomenon will help us define what we are and how we can provide a better civilizational framework to us and to the world professor devi pointed out that a conspiracy of silence in dropping the names of 12 tribes who uh, cross the brahmaputra perennially uh, from the list of citizens of the country is more dismal than dropping the islam islamic religion this was the statement he made one has to think over that in his opinion the state has imposed aphasia on people the fact that hindi is mentioned as language of 52 crores of indians is uh, which also puts aphasia on the hilly areas of north chatisgarh bhojpuri and parts of mp professor devi sees a correlation between this aphasia and the violence that flare up time and again in these areas and separation of people he spoke about chhatrapati shivaji maharaj later to aurangzeb in which maharaja accuses aurangzeb of simply collecting taxes and failing to look after welfare of his people it could as well be addressed to the governments of south asians he suggested professor devi also expressed the hope that the south asian minds 
and cultures will come handy in the event of environmental crisis and crisis due to spread of uh, technology in the world. This was a very thought provoking lecture by an alumnus of this university whose presence among us has never failed to delight us. Uh, Professor Devi himself was in chair for the session too, and Professor Prabhat Patnaik was a speaker, first speaker. Uh, he made a statement that there's a great misconception about capital in South Asia. He, his topic was, of course, capitalism in the uh, South Asia. There's a uh, great misconception about capital in South Asia that neoliberalism has lifted South Asia out of poverty. India and Bangladesh are said to be success stories of uh, neoliberalism. This impression, he said, is wrong. And he gave uh, following reasoning for that. The poverty ratio increased during neoliberalism together with acceleration in GDP. We have increased the poverty ratio. Professor Patnai called demonetization and GST were blunders of Modi government since they devastated the petty producers, but argued that even otherwise, neoliberalism was having a great impact, great negative impact on the economy. Access to calorie, which defines power, poverty, uh, is continuously on the decrease. The poverty line is updated frequently, so does not reflect the actual reality. The privatization of education and healthcare has increased, so people have to cut on calorie. Uh, he called this as calorie puzzle in Bangladesh, but it could have well been uh, the calorie puzzle of India. We have witnessed worsening of poverty with increase in GDP. That is a characteristic I already mentioned. There's a relative freedom of movement of capital and finance across the countries uh, under neoliberalism. Hence, the nation states have to behave as per wishes of international finance. This has impact on the democracy in the country. Uh, he mentioned that Keynes had already warned that the capital has to be national and not international. States do not support agriculture and pe uh, petty producers. Substantial migration from countryside to uh, towns is taking place. Towns also have no jobs. Because of free flow, the industry has to be competitive. It has to modernize. This increases labor productivity, but reduces the uh, employment. Professor Patnai articulated the scenario and demonstrated how neoliberalization is leading to stagnation world over again. He added that there is no way he can see out of this. Uh, the next speaker was Mr. Saeed Nakvi, who described the complex cities of uh, uh, the recent Afghanistan polity. Professor Urvashi Butalia spoke on painful experience of partition in 1947 and narrated three touching stories. I I'll be brief. Uh, for the remaining uh, this thing. And for the sake of record, I will be mentioning this. Professor Ganesh Devi summarized the speeches and offered his comments. Fourth session on the day two was on South Asia, the challenges to cultural diversity and multiculturalism. 
The first speaker was uh, Jatin Desai. He said that multiculturalism is the is most relevant in South Asia since all countries are having this problem. All countries are having a mix of different cultures. India has uh, a mix of uh, uh, various religions. Am I? Oh, sorry. So, uh, Jatin was saying that the issue is most relevant in South Asia since all countries uh, in uh, South Asia are facing it. And since it was 30 Jan, he began with the question, why was uh, Mahatma Gandhi assassinated? It was a planned conspiracy, he said, and was uh, he was assassinated in the eighth attempt. He called himself a Sanatan Hindu, but having different viewpoints from Hindutva. Uh, regarding various uh, topics. Gandhi believed in uh, democracy, but Hindutva behaves only in majority and some. The Dharma Parishad recently uh, justified Nathuram. No action was taken against them. The policy of uh, the ruler says that no action will be taken. This majoritinism is most dangerous. A call was given in the Dharma Samsat to massacre Muslims. Are we heading to majoritinism? He uh, asked. Some institutes are struggling to hold the values of constitution. Uh, that was the situation in India, but in Pakistan also, uh, a movement which was celebrated as Jio Sindh is under attack. Various cases of sedition there are placed. In India, many freedom writers uh, were against sedition. Pathuns are also facing serious repression. The student movement has raised. Uh, various issues in uh, Pakistan. The Baloch nationalism is a serious movement, serious challenge. Anybody uh, trying to analyze Baloch question is called anti-nationalist. I, I feel that I'm again reading for India only. The in Afghanistan, many Hajras were killed. The leaders of Tajik had to take shelter in Tajikistan. India used to support uh, Tajiks, but now they are not getting support. In a couple of months, Afghanistan will be starving. In uh, Sri Lanka, LTTE was crushed in 2009, and nobody now cares for uh, Tamil aspirations. Rohingya are suffering in Myanmar. Three lakh Rohingyas had to flee to Bangladesh. Instead of sympathy, India is taking a hard line. It's not providing shelter to them now. Only Hindus and Sikhs from Afghanistan will be given shelter. That is the policy our Home Minister has declared. India does not have a refugee law and the government decides whom to give shelter based on its sweet will. Indian constitution came from freedom struggle, but 
uh, it is, uh, but majority anism is there all over India. SARC is ineffective. Since 2014, we have not been able to organize SARC summit. Citizens of uh, South Asia and should revive SARC and discuss these issues. Dr. Aminash Pandey was the next speaker. He talked about the notion of multilingualism. Uh, he said that uh, in uh, South Asia, people have used different linguistic varieties in everyday life. This is not very common in the world. What it means to know a language The, uh, the person will start engagement, uh, a, a partial engagement with the other language and uh, uh, will develop it as the relations develop. This has become a cultural disposition of South Asia. Now this resonates with what uh, uh, Dr. Devi was saying. Nobody uh, can find a person who does not meet others on neutral languages, just as the other uh, country people do. Our languages in South Asia will become like each other because of this uh, attitude. This dynamics is uh, very peculiar. Majority of debates is about losing mother tongue uh, or genocide of mother tongue. The reason is very complex. He pointed out rightly that human knowledge is exerting a lot of pressure on languages. He went on analyzing the language situation uh, and made very uh, relevant points. Uh, for example, his observation was that Dalits prefer English to their mother tongue. Uh, and there's a climate of greater visibility with the hope of getting more allocation uh, for languages. For example, Kokani, Maithili, Bhojpuri. Uh, they demanded to be included in a schedule and got it. Uh, there is also a demand to include in classical language uh, we Marathi people are being uh, agitating for, not agitating, we are uh, making that demand. Uh, Dr. Avinash Pandey has built a model of uh, languages, diversity in languages, and he likens it to the use of biodiversity uh, to understand linguistic diversity. I will not go into that model, but uh, his insistence was that the mother tongue should be seen as a flow and not as an object. He talked about the aesthetics of textuality, which depended at first on the on Sanskrit in India, and now depends on Sanskrit plus uh, English, English plus Sanskrit rather. The uh, linguistic of South Asia were already defined as okay. now. Uh, sorry, he, he made an observation that uh, the mother tongues are being refashioned, and the uh, arguments are making a category mistake to treat snapshot as a whole picture. The next speaker was uh, Dr. Parimal. He spoke on nationalism, subnationalism, and uh, transnationalism. 
he uh, listed four elements uh, which the people will have to have to uh, in order to to be constituted as a nation one is a stable community of people second is a common language three a continuous common geographical territory and fourth uh, they should be having an economic life dependent on each other for the uh, this is uh, uh, required for constitution of a nation nationalism thrived on a common cause that of freedom struggle in india in absence of uh, british colonialism that means after they have left the idea of inclusiveness has ensured uh, our uh, being together subnationalism he said existed but did not uh, overpower nationalism two types of sub, uh, subnationalisms he talked one is linguistic and the second is subaltern nationalism the uh, next session was uh, saida uh, role of literary translations ms saida hamid madam samida hamid uh talked about role of literary translation in building a dialogue she said she began with a very emotional statement saying that our countries are our, our heart and soul translations create understanding he took example of the book which uh, she has translated Uh, from hindu to urdu or urdu to hindi we uh, she uh, and he introduced he he uh, talked about the uh, writers the story writers which are included in a book uh, called parvez which means light by her she has done musaddise hali that's a book and uh, wants that it should reach uh, in different languages it should again be translated the next speaker was uh, sachin ketkar he described he began with a, a poem of arun kolatkar and described and compared two translations of it the uh professor lao pi today he uh, talked on the hegemony of khas arya population in all walks of life in nepal and uh, try to explore why this hegemony is there how in spite of having a, a progressive uh, constitution the um, provisions are made in such a way that they cancel the uh, effect of all the progressive all this am i saying something uh mr taimur rahman described how abida parvin brought about a revolutionary 
uh, attitudinal change in the Pakistani ethos. Uh, so much so that now Coke Studio, even the corporates have joined uh, that ethos and uh, they support the uh, emergence of uh, Coke Studio. He described the historical role of uh, religion and religious institutions in the history of Pakistan. He made a uh, very interesting statement that doctrines do not make history, but people do. That resonates with all uh, Marxists. This has obviously many lessons for India. You cannot rely on any doctrines. Uh, today, of course, uh, uh, we have heard uh, Iruduya Rajan, who talked about migration in South Asia during COVID-19. Uh, he complained that no good database is available. Uh, he classified the migrants as immigrants and diaspora and uh, urged for to have policies on international migration. Now, since uh, this was very eloquently summed up by uh, Jatin Desai, who was in the chair, I need not repeat. Uh, through all the seas. Pratap Aspe, of course, talked about Kashmir, said that it was a complex issue. And uh, in order to understand the present, we have to understand the past. And he began with the partition, uh, the, the, the independence time, and uh, what was the Kashmir situation then. He could not uh, obviously complete his speech. Uh, Vivek Tiwari, of course, gave a very interesting talk on influence of China on South Asian countries. He talked about the One Belt, One Road project and how it is likely to affect the uh, life of people uh, whose nations have uh, been included in that project. So we have come to this stage now. Uh, we are eager to hear the valedictory speech. Uh, so Arundhati, over back to you. Thank you, sir, for the review of the sessions during the three-day symposium. We will now move on to the much-awaited valedictory speech by Mr. Kumar Ketkar, the person who is known to be a journalist par excellence, an editor and writer turned politician in India, as he is the member of Rajya Sabha and the recipient of Padma Shri Award. Mr. Ketkar received the prestigious award Indian Affairs Transformational Journalist of the Decade for his journalistic excellence. He has written and provided media coverage to many significant events in international affairs. He was also India coordinator for South Asian Free Media Association. His virtual presence for these three days at the symposium has been a great motivation to all. I request Mr. Kumar Ketkar to deliver his valedictory address. Sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to give valedictory address, which I don't think I was competent after having heard. Romila Thapar, Ganesh Devi, Prabhat Patnaik, and such stalwarts. But since 
Megha and Sharad thought that I am competent enough to display my incompetence. I thought, let me take a try. The subject that is chosen is truly extremely relevant and not only relevant, but also extremely controversial. And that's why I chose to say that we are having a specter of uncertainty. In fact, I wanted to say we are heading or we are expecting a specter of evil uncertainty. The reason of uh, this kind of apparently pessimistic view, I would not like to describe the world or the world view in terms of pessimism and optimism. Because almost all the speakers whom I heard were simultaneously pessimist and optimist, including Jain Devi or for that matter, including Prabhat Patnaik. The reasons they gave were various. Like Prabhat Patnaik gave a very brilliant exposition on the crisis of capitalism in the neoliberal worldview. Romila Thapar took a historical view and Ganesh Devi talked about the genocide of languages, which is also going to cause problems. So everybody was partly optimistic and partly pessimistic. That doesn't mean that I have to take any of the specific positions as Sarad Naure has given a brief review of all the speeches. So forgive me at times if I appear to be neither pessimist or optimist, but cynical. I will not be consciously cynical, but if cynicism provides the realism into that cynicism, then I think we should be ready for realism rather than accuse me of cynicism. I generally would not like to prepare written speeches for such occasions because I'm not a kind of an academic who prepares papers. But this time I decided to write a kind of a paper or the validity address. So I'll begin with uh, this preface and partly read out and partly extempore. Well, actually the simple thing which everybody knows is that the whole world today is passing through an unprecedented turbulence. And such unprecedented turbulence will inevitably touch South Asia. South Asia cannot isolate itself or quarantine itself these days from the world's turbulence. And turbulence is not, let me repeat, caused by pandemic alone. Pandemic actually accentuated the crisis of uh, uncertainty and the crisis of turbulence. So pandemic played it apart. Suppose there was no pandemic. Even then, we are facing the evil uncertainty. Like if you look back just two years, 2019, because 2020 January or 2020 March is when the pandemic was identified and the noise began around on the pandemic issue. But in 2019, 2018, and so on and so forth, if you begin to look back, you'll find that after the election of Donald Trump in 2016, suddenly the world was awakened to the fact that the entire centrist position of the world or the dominant ideology of left liberalism or the dominant ideology partly of non-alignment in Indian context or general simple liberalism, centrist liberalism, which dominated the world almost till 2016, we got you know, re to realize in 2016 that the world is not so simple and the world is not so easy to understand under the neoliberal crisis, which had begun sometime in 1991 after the collapse of Soviet Union. Now, the question is, India is a very strange kind of a country. In fact, we call ourselves a nation only now recently. Actually, a nation is emerging. The idea of India is still an emerging idea. It is not set idea. Like suppose on 14th August 1947, India was one country, British India. But on 15th August, formally, there were two countries. 
And in 1971, formally, there were three countries. And if the Karistani movement had succeeded, which appeared to be succeeding for some time, for a few weeks, then India would have been partitioned again and Khalistan would have been born. Forget Khalistan. In the 1960s, Dravidian movement in Tamil Nadu had demanded that let them have a separate currency, separate trade agreements, separate foreign policy, even by remaining within Indian Union. But everybody understood that that was perhaps the beginning of demanding separate Tamil Nadu. Late in the 70s and early 80s, Prabhakaran in Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka declared, he came to Tamil Nadu and declared and spoke from Sri Lanka and declared that there is something called Vishal Tamil Nadu, which incorporated the north of Sri Lanka, which was the Tamil region, and Tamil Nadu itself. So there can be a Vishal Tamil Nadu. Just as Khalistan is thought that there can be a Vishal Punjab, Vishal Khalistan, including parts of Pakistani Punjab. I think many of you remember the 1971 war 50 years ago, when there were voices in Bengal, as well as in later Bangladesh, East Pakistan then, that there can be a Shonar Bangla, a separate country within the Republic. It did not get momentum. That particular idea did not get traction, but it was definitely mentioned. Just as it was mentioned that there can be separate Dravidistan. So Dravidistan, Shonar Bangla, Khalistan, and all of us are familiar with the so-called separatist movement or identitarian movements in Nagaland and Mizoram, and generally Northeast. Arunachal is in crisis for completely different reasons. There are people who say that China has occupied parts of Arunachal. But there are also people, historians, who say that actually Arunachal is under dispute. It is not settled which part of Arunachal or Arunachal itself is part of China or part of India or a disputed territory. So Northeast is in crisis. South was in crisis. North was in crisis. So the only areas, including East was in crisis in Bangal West Bengal and Bangladesh, only areas that were not in such kind of a separatist crisis were the landlocked states in India. That is UP, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan. They are landlocked. So, so ultimately, many people thought that that is India. And if you notice, it is that India which is having the Bharatiya Janata Paksha rule, and not only having Bharatiya Janata Paksha majority, but also Hindutva dominant ideology. Now there is a feeling, and there is also commentary all over the country, and in the TV debates, that there are only two national parties. One is BJP, and another is Congress. All others are, all other parties are relatively smaller or regional. This itself is a misnomer. BJP also is a regional party in the sense that BJP has no base in Tamil Nadu. BJP has no base in Kerala. BJP has virtually no base in Tarangana or Andhra. BJP has very, very little base in Bengal. And BJP has extremely small base in the Northeast. So BJP is primarily in the Hindi belt, what is also known as cow belt. So BJP is also a regional party. In that respect, even if Congress Mukta Bharat, so-called Congress Mukta Bharat, Congress continues to be a national party because small or big, but Congress does have presence in every single state. It may be small. It can be even insignificant from according to some point of view. But Congress is there. And therefore, to say that there are two national parties, Congress and BJP, is not only a misnomer, it is misleading to understand political process. We must recognize the fact that the idea of multi-regional, multicultural, multilinguistic states formation, reorganization of states that came to exist immediately after independence and after reorganization of states was done on linguistic party, linguistic basis, partly cultural basis, it had reference to a great extent to Soviet Union. Because Soviet Union had so many states. Georgia and 
Belarusia and Ukraine, and, you know, so Azerbaijan, and I don't want to go into that, Armenia, and so many Soviet states, which ultimately turned out to be 15 independent republics. Everybody thought that Union of Soviet Socialist Republics have come to stay. Nobody ever thought in the 60s or in the 40s or in the 70s or even 80s that this Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, named the Soviet Union, which was a superpower, a nuclear superpower, which could challenge the American superpower status, which could create a bipolar world in the Cold War, such Soviet Union with nuclear power could disintegrate into 15 sovereign independent republics. All those republics did not go to war with each other, but to a certain extent they did. Like Chechnya confronted Russia, like Azerbaijan and Armenia fought with each other. Just now we are seeing the world is supposed to be heading towards another catastrophe or Ukraine. When Russia says that Ukraine is part of Russia, that part of Ukraine, and United States is challenging them. So that part which was USSR, Soviet Union, today is in cauldron. And that cauldron has started coming up. That heat has started coming up only after 1991 and primarily after 2001. Why did I say 2001? Because in 2001, we saw the World Trade Center and the Pentagon getting attacked from the Middle East terrorists, or what are known as, as Islamic terrorists, Arab terrorists. Interestingly, none of those so-called Arab terrorists came from Iraq or Afghanistan. Majority of them came from Saudi Arabia, Morocco, and some other countries, including Egypt. None of them had come from Iraq, or none of them had come from Afghanistan. But taking advantage of that attack on America, the first ever attack, after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1945, 1941, first attack after 1941 on Pearl Harbor, this is the attack on American soil. Pearl Harbor was not exactly on the American soil in 1941, but this was straight into the heart of the United States of America, and that too, the heart of the capitalism on the World Trade Center in Manhattan where the global trade takes place, global stock market decide, decides what to do with the wealth that they generate. That was the capital of the new liberal ideology. That was the Wall Street. And the attack took place on Wall Street in the World Trade Center. So after 2001, first attack on the global peace or global arrangement or the global Cold War divide of the world, binary world, was in 1991 when Soviet Union collapsed and disintegrated into 15 independent republics. The second crisis came in 2001 when another superpower, US, came under attack from so-called Asian African countries of Egypt and Saudi Arabia and so on and so forth. So the world went into turmoil. So there is turbulence ever since going on from 1991. It is not as if there was no such turbulence before. There was. The First World War came out of huge turbulence. Second World War came out of even worse situation when Hitler dominated Germany, not only Germany, but he wanted to create Fortress Europe. And in that Fortress Europe, he wanted to finish all Jews, kill all Jews in the entire European continent. And strangely, we, don't, we must not forget that Hitler was not only a product of German monopoly capitalism, which he was, but he was certainly supported by the right wing in England and right wing in America. The Lindberghs and the Fords in America had defended Hitler and some of the right wingers, conservatives in England had supported Hitler. Why did they support Hitler? Quietly and subtly, because they thought Hitler being a classical anti-communist, Nazis being anti-communist, Hitler will attack Soviet Union and finish the rising Soviet Union at that point of time. Soviet Union had come into sort of a powerful economy despite world depression when other countries collapsed. Russia, the Soviet Union at that time did not collapse in 1929 
and that was supposed to be the credit of Joseph Stalin. Whether Joseph Stalin is to be condemned or not is a different question. I don't want to go into that. But Russia emerged, Soviet Union emerged out of the First World War when the revolution took place, 1929 when the Great Depression took place, and the Second World War, which actually defeated Hitler completely and created Soviet Union a most powerful center. The Western powers, the right-wingers, the neoliberals at that time, they were not known as neoliberals then. They did not want this to happen, so they wanted to stop Stalin and Soviet Union and Red Army in tracks, and that's why they were supporting Hitler. But either Red Army strategists or Stalin or Communist Party overturned the table, first by signing a treaty with Germany and second by joining allies to defeat the Nazi forces of Hitler and, of course, fascist forces of Italy under Mussolini. The victory in Second World War, even the right-wingers in America and England had to concede, was partly because of the leadership of Red Army and also because of Stalin. And that, if Red Army was not there, it would have been difficult for allies to defeat the Nazi forces. So strangely, Churchill mentioned in one conversation that strangely, the dictatorial Red Army, the dictatorial politics of Red Army and Soviet Union has helped to bring about and sustain the Western democracies. So they always thought that West was a democratic area and the East, that is led by Soviet Union, was a non-democratic, anti-democratic, dictatorial, totalitarian, authoritarian, etc., etc. So actually, there was turbulence in the First World War time, which generated energy to create Soviet Union or Russia, Bolshevik Russia. Second World War also turbulence, and together these two wars have killed something like 8 crore people, devastated more than 100 crore people across the country, across the world. And yet, that turbulence, according to me, in today's context, has a different dimension and also had a positive outlook. Because Hitler was to be defeated, and the red and the not so red or whites came together to defeat the Nazis. Today, there is no such thing. Today, there is no red army. Today, there is no socialist ideology. Today, there is no left, liberal, democratic, secular, progressive force anywhere in the country dominant. Formerly, communist countries like Hungary have a vicious right-wing government. Turkey, which had the great liberal tradition after 1920s, is ruled by another dictatorial, authoritarian, communal force. Brazil, which was once upon a time seen as an ideal emerging liberal place, today is run by Bolsonaro, who is equivalent to Narendra Modi or a fascist leadership. So whether you are in Latin America, whether you are in Middle East, whether you are in Indian subcontinent, that is South Asia, Pakistan, you will find, or Afghanistan, everywhere there is a huge turbulence. And that turbulence cannot be unfortunately defined by ideology. What is the ideology of Taliban? What is the ideology of Imran Khan? What is the ideology of Nepal government? What is the ideology of Sri Lankan government? Whichever Sri Lankan government, Sri Lankan government tried to isolate, undermine the Tamilian culture, Tamilian language, and Tamilian people. Small. The whole of Sri Lanka is only two crore people. The whole of Sri Lanka, including Tamil Naf, is only two crore people. You know what it means to be two crore people? Two crore people is a population of Mumbai region, whole of Mumbai, MMRDA. Mumbai metropolitan region's population is two crores. So Sri Lanka is equal to whole of metropolitan region of Mumbai, including Mumbai city. That is a two crore people. In that two crore population, there is a civil war. There was a severe civil war going on between Tamilians and Shailis. Thousands of people were killed. At one point, Indian peacekeeping forces were also involved. So small country like Sri Lanka, on the south of India, could face civil war of that magnitude and that intensity shows 
that in South Asia, there are hundreds of such political landmines which can disrupt the integrity, unity, if at all there is unity of South Asia. And those landmines are so powerful that they do not relate themselves to their own country. Like Sri Lankan crisis can snowball into Tamil Nadu. Bangladesh crisis has often snowballed in West Bengal. The Punjab crisis in our Punjab has resulted in crisis in Punjab, Pakistan. For instance, many of you know, and in case you don't know or don't believe in conspiracy theories, the fact is that under Ziaul Haq, the military ruler of Pakistan, he was directly helping the Khalistani forces and it was almost planned to the T that Khalistan Republic will be declared from the Amritsar Golden Temple with support of the religious population in Punjab among Sikhs, supported by international Sikh organizations in Canada, US and UK. All plans were ready to declare Republic of Khalistan. In fact, in New York Times, there was an advertisement called Republic of Khalistan. We welcome Republic of Khalistan. So the forces of disintegration of India were already working with the help of Pakistan. Pakistan wanted to take revenge of division of Pakistan. And their belief is that it is India which created Bangladesh by splitting Pakistan. So it is Pakistan's revenge to split India and create Khalistan. The movement to create Khalistan still goes on, but it is weak. If Indira Gandhi had not acted quickly and decisively to defeat the Khalistani forces, the Khalistani terrorist forces, by even sacrificing her own life, perhaps in 1983-84, we would have seen the partition of India, second partition of India, and the birth of Khalistan. But Mrs. Gandhi took the risk. She knew what was coming to her own life by taking that decision. In fact, she said just one day before she was killed that I know I will have to pay with my blood for this decision. And that happened, unfortunately. The point is, these are the feelings and these are the events. These are the episodes which have taken place in just last 75 years. We are celebrating 75th year of India's integrity and unity. If I have to assess the situation of today and visualize and extrapolate that situation for let us say 2047, which will be centenary of India's independence or 2050, which will be centenary of India's Republic, it will not be easy for me to say that the same geographic Indian identity will be there in 2047 or 2050. I wish it is there. It is our duty of those who are listening to the speech or those who are working today in politics or in social movements. It depends on us what we think today, what we do today, as to what will happen in 2047 and 2050. Otherwise, the same fate that happened to Soviet Union could happen to India. We may remain complacent about the integrity and unity of India, like Soviet Union did. And just within one year, I happened to be there in Soviet Union at that time, when the Soviet Union got disintegrated. I remember distinctly when here in the rest of the world, George Bush Sr. had begun his attack on Iraq to liberate Kuwait in 1991. At that very time, the newspapers could not give real headlines. The real headlines on the eastern side was Lithuania had begun to send its independent forces against Soviet Union, against Russia. And Russian tanks had entered Lithuania. So Russian tanks had entered Lithuania when American tanks were entering Iraq or American planes were bombing Iraq. So actually the Cold War binary world had begun to collapse almost in the same year and same month. It is on 17 January 1991 when George Bush Sr. decided to attack Iraq. And it was the second week of January in Lithuania when Lithuanian liberating forces said we want to liberate from Russia or from Soviet Union. So the binary was collapsing. 
Soon after that, within one year after that, after the Soviet Union collapsed on 25th December 1991, formally, next year, the Yugoslavian Republic came into crisis. Yugoslavia was originally a place which had united and brought together several Balkan states, like Serbia, Bosnia, Montenegro, Slovenia. All of them had come together, Croatia, and had formed Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, the socialist integrated Yugoslavia was born after the Second World War, but its united forces were operating from 1920 when Yugoslavia term came into existence. Yugoslavia survived and grew, and actually Joseph Tito was colleague of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru together while forming non-alignment movement. So Yugoslavia was a powerful force. That Yugoslavia started disintegrating in 1992 and the process was complete in 1997 when six states emerged out of Yugoslavia. And what was Yugoslavia's population? United Yugoslavia's population was a little up over three crores. Little over three crores, which is almost one fourth of Maharashtra's population. If we want to superficially and which may appear ridiculous, ridiculously you can say, or superficially, compare, say, Maharashtra with Yugoslavia, it is like Vidarbha going against Maratwara, Maratwara going against Kokan, Kokan going against Western Maharashtra. But they had actual armies and they were bombing each other. Bosnia and Serbia were killing each other. Croatia was killing Bosnians and Serbia was killing Bosnians. Bosnians were Muslims. So the six states out of Yugoslavia declared republic their independent sovereign republic, nobody had thought, even after collapse of Soviet Union, that within one year, the process of disintegration of Yugoslavia would begin. By 1998, there was no Yugoslavia. So the century ended, 20th century ended, by dismantling whatever it had created as United Project. Soviet Union was a United Project, Yugoslavia was a United Project, Indian Union was a United Project, and you may recall that it was in 1991 to 1996, European Union came together. Just when Soviet Union was disintegrating, Yugoslavia was disintegrating, European Union was coming together to mobilize all the neoliberal capitalists in one block of European Union. But that also became an illusion shortly. We have seen in last decade how the European Union is suffering. There are countries like Greece and even Scotland and UK. UK also wants to get out of it. UK never anyway subscribe to Europe. But Scotland now wants to break away from UK, whether it happens or not is the material. But the point is in Scotland, the identitarian politics is taking shape. So the whole world, which looked rather simple and globalized world in year 2000, began to disintegrate in the 21st century. And now we are in that 21st century when the turbulence is actually enhanced and magnified and horrified by the arrival of new technology. There were no mobile phones in 1991 when Soviet Union disintegrated. No mobile phones when Yugoslavia disintegrated. In fact, no mobile phones in, when European Union came together. No mobile phone when Iraq was attacked by US. After 1995-96, we saw this new technology of mobile phones, which was further helped currently by artificial intelligence and a whole satellite network to support them, creating completely different kinds of capitalist monopolies like Facebook and others, Google. Now, without Google, we cannot think of our existence either in the information society or in political society. By the way, Google did not exist in 1996. That is 25 years ago, there was no Google. Nobody heard of Google, nobody knew about the company called Google. And that company in the last 25 years has taken over our entire lives. Today, the trade is handled by them and traffic is also handled by them. So Google is going to decide the future network of nations and the peoples. 
and google is a different capitalist ball game than the earlier capitalist who operated in market it is not even market economy it is something beyond market economy but having the market principle in command it is capitalism it is neoliberal capitalism but it is a neoliberal capitalism driven by technology and those technologies which are governing your and my mind and that mind is actually helping to disintegrate the world it was impossible without the help of the whatsapp university without the help of the facebook and facebook and the google to have such kind of fanaticism and frenzy of hinduism it was impossible similarly even in small countries like myanmar the hatred and the violence against rohingya muslims would not have been so easily possible in the binary cold war world that has all happened after the arrival of mobile phone and mainly after the arrival of google that doesn't mean google is responsible for it what is happening is mindless technology without ideology so technology is replacing ideology and if technology replaces ideology and profit replaces surplus then in that situation whichever company software company or otherwise silicon valley or otherwise whichever company is able to deliver more simple gadgets to you will make more money and so they are interested in money as well as spread of technology so on the one hand that technology is doing a good job of connecting the world we thought technology is creating a borderless world many of you might remember in 1989 to 1991 there was this notion of end of history earlier before that 30 years before that there was the notion of end of ideology in 1991 the idea of end of history was dominant but actually what we are seeing is recreation of history and recreation of history of conflict and that conflict is not generated by idea of nationalism that new idea of new history is being generated in the name of religion in the name of faith not only here so of you may have read or heard about the new york times report saying that trump was essentially helped by the new radical fundamentalist christian movement similarly in iran we are seeing a new fundamentalism of khomeini or khomeini type and the khomeini and others which was different in 1979 79 when the iranian revolution took place it is more intensified version in saudi arabia in iran in america and in india and in myanmar and in pakistan and in bangladesh and in sri lanka we are finding people and ideologies which have nothing to do with any idealism or any ideas at all they are driven by completely different forces completely anarchic forces i could have understood even if sri lankan nationalism versus tamil nationalism it is no more that it is sri lankan versus tamilian fundamentalism it is not nationalism of the kind which could have perhaps given a different dimension similarly the hindu rashtra idea today under narendra modi is not the same hindu rashtra idea that vaspi practiced vaspi also belonged to the same rss school but he did not project himself as the representative of hindu rashtra which amit shah and modi are doing how can any even during vajpayee's time it would have been perhaps difficult for dharma sansad to say in hyderabad openly that what we are looking for is a massacre of muslims eliminate muslims completely golwalkar had said way back in 1930s that hitler is right in eliminating all jews we should think of similar similar plans even in india at that time he had of course muslims and also christians in mind but that idea did not really get traction in india golwalkar's party could not win any election after 1942 52 when jansang was formed by rss jansang did not get even 67 seats which was the maximum they got in 1967 beyond that they could not go till almost babri masjid was destroyed it is after babri masjid was destroyed that bjp began to get traction till that time they were a force a right wing force a communal force a fundamentalist force but they did not have the social sanction interestingly it is the middle class the educated middle class 
who is a beneficiary of Nehruian economy, beneficiary of public sector banks, beneficiary of public sector in general, beneficiary of so many independent organized, productive organizations from Durgapur, Bhilai, and other places like HOC and HMT, they created the middle class. There was just about 1% of the middle class at the time of independence. Today, they are 40%. Most of them are educated. A large number of them have migrated to states and Silicon Valley and dictate Hinduism from America to Indians. And the Indian middle class, which is resident non-Indian, they are non-resident Indians. So non-resident Indians is calling shots to the resident non-Indian that you also practice the Hindu ideology here. So we have this new arrival of new Hinduism, which was not so powerful even during Vajpayee's time. Though Vajpayee belonged to the same school of thought. Vajpayee did not give a call for Congress Muktarashtra. Vajpayee did not call, give a call to completely demolish Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and his ideology and his family. That doesn't mean Vajpayee was a saint. That doesn't mean that Vajpayee did not believe in the idea of Hindutva. But his Hindutva did not degenerate into the kind of Hindutva that we are witnessing today under Narendra Modi and Shah, who are giving a new call and a new sanctity and new legitimacy to the fanatic notion of Hindutva. Where it will take us, you can't say. I will not be surprised. I don't want to predict. We are in 2022 and next elections are due in 2024. I will not be surprised, I will not be shocked if there is some kind of renewed violence in the next two years. They are attempting that very much and Haridwar Dharma Samasad was because of that, to aim at that. Even day for yesterday, Amit Shah, what he gave a speech in Muzaffar, Muzaffar Nagar clearly showed that his aim is to create Hindu-Muslim divide, not divide. Hindu-Muslim divide has been practiced even earlier. But this Hindu Muslim divide is to create riots, to create ruckus, to create massacres. And on the wave of that massacre, on the wave of that fundamentalism, get elected again in 2024. If in 2024, with these forces in command, in political command, if Modi and Shah and their ideology, so called ideology of Hindu Rashtra, come to power, we are heading for a greater crisis between 2024 and 2029. I would not be surprised if the violence starts stalking at your home, stalking in your colleges, and stalking in all the institutions. Already, most of the institutions which are created by independence movement, from Reserve Bank of India, though it was born in 1935, Reserve Bank of India had autonomous status. CBI was autonomous. Election Commission was autonomous. They are the products after freedom. All those are undermined. NIA was a creation during UPA, UPA government, but NIA has been taken over. So every single autonomous liberal organization has been undermined by Modi and Shah, and they are ruling it, and they are dictating terms, and they are following it, and they are following it on whose behalf? The middle class. It is educated middle class in urban and rural centers, educated middle class among the BCs and OBCs, educated middle class in Adivasis, educated middle class in any part, any caste, any religion is supporting the fundamentalist idea today. Nobody would have thought that the qualified surgeons and the qualified engineers and qualified doctors and qualified space engineers talking in terms of Hinduism and Hindutva, which they had never talked, they would not have got education if Pandit Nehru had not started the scientific temper, idea of scientific temper. And with the idea of scientific temper, the institutions like IITs and the physical laboratories and the chemical laboratories and the new world. That world, that new world turned out to be sarcastically brave new world, the way it got handed over to these fascist forces. Our task is to defeat these forces. And then only perhaps we can overcome this turbulence. I am not saying that this turbulence will definitely lead necessarily 
to disintegration of India or fascist taking over, but that possibility is there and therefore we have to be extremely alert to see that they don't take over. How do we do that? We have to understand the destructive nature and tone of technology, particularly on the educated middle class. And unless the educated middle class turns its back on this ideology, I don't think it is possible. Once upon a time, even I believed that it is the working class which needs to be in vanguard to make a change. It is not just enough to understand the world, but to change the world. Today, time has come when we have to first understand the world before trying to change the world. Because understanding, understanding itself is creating a problem. While understanding itself, there are people who are soft on Hindutva and still call themselves liberal. Then there are people who are completely anti-Hindutva without looking into the nature of reality and directly confronting the middle class because they want the support of the middle class. They are ready to succumb and connive at that middle class lifestyle. Today, that kind of consumerism, that kind of hedonism has come to be a real situation. All the shopping malls, all the big malls and Inox theaters, they are not just entertainment and they are not just trade. They are the centers of new ideology. Pandit Nehru had thought that Bhakran Angal, Durgapur and Vilay were the new temples of modernity and scientific temple. Today, such new temples of fundamentalism, anarchy, hedonism, and indifference and insensitive society are the shopping malls and inox and overall consumerism, consumerism promoted by corporates. These corporates get their energy from international agencies of Mossad in Israel, which we are seeing in the form of Pegasus, and also CIA in America, and some European intelligence agencies which are working for this corporate capitalism. So we have a larger global fight. Once Amartya Sen said, yes, I believe in globalization because the globalization will initiate the fight against the right-wing globalization by the left liberal globalization. So our task is to mobilize the left liberal centrist secular progressive forces globally to fight the globalization of the right and the neoliberals. Prabhat Patnaik gave a very clear warning. I will repeat that warning and I will merely say that we are heading for a very difficult period and let this seminar make us serious about the challenge and about the threat that the evil uncertainty is having its specter on us. It is haunting us. The specter of evil uncertainty is haunting us. We shall overcome, provided we stay together with ideology, because ideology finally can defeat the mindless technology. But we must have ideology today. Today, nobody is discussing ideology. Let us create ideological platform without converting ideology into some kind of sectarianism. Ideologies have often led to kind of ideological sectarianism. Our task is to build ideology without being sectarian and without being partisan only to certain sections, but take, our, take along all people who are ready to be liberal, not necessarily who are in agreement on every issue with us, but unite the people and we shall overcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your overview of the ideological and political. Yes, Megha? Megha, anything to say? No, continue. Yes. Thank you, sir, for your overview of the ideological and political turbulence across the world from 20th to 21st century and the need to be not complacent about the present political scenario. Thank you for your brilliant analysis and for your eloquent speech on the endangered new world that is with the mindless technology and without ideology, for awakening the spirit of resistance and need for change by creating ideological platform. I now request one of the conveners of the symposium, Indira Gazeva from Russian State University to present her views. <clears throat> Namaskaram. Adaraniya Sangushthi Pratibhagiyo. 
आयोजक समिति डॉक्टर मेघ पंसारे विदेशी भाषा विभाग अध्यक्ष प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर रणबीर रणधीर शिंदे प्रमुख मराठी भाषा विभाग अध्यक्ष डॉक्टर अरुंदाजी पावर प्रोफेसर अलेक्जांडर स्तलेरोफ मिस्टर शरात नावारे मिस्टर कुमार केतकर प्रोफेसर पी सी पटेल रूसी राजकीय मानविकी विश्वविद्यालय की ओर से में हम इस संगोष्ठी में भाग लेने वाले लोगों को आभार व्यक्त करते हैं महत्वपूर्ण बात यह है कि यह संगोष्ठी भारतीय लोगों की मनाए हुए भारत के गणतंत्र दिवस के दिनों में चल रहे हैं रूसी लोगों की ओर से हम आप सभी को गणतंत्र दिवस की बधाई देते हैं आतख विषय संगोष्ठी दक्षिण एशिया के आधुनिक विज्ञान के समय का अनुसंधान नंबर चार का आयोजन शिवजी विश्वविद्यालय तथा रूसी राज्य के मानविकी विश्वविद्यालय द्वारा संयुक्त रूप में किया गया है संगोष्ठी तीन दिनों तक चली है और सफल कार्य किया गया है अतख विषय अनुसंधान से संबंधित ये चौथी संगोष्ठी है संगोष्ठी का उद्देश्य दक्षिण एशिया के देशों के इतिहास समाज साहित्य भाषा नीति अंतरराष्ट्रीय अंतरराष्ट्रीय संबंध लैंगिक मुद्दों पर चर्चा करना था संगोष्ठी में सात से अधिक वक्ताओं में भाग लिया है इसका विषय बहुत व्यापक था इसमें नाव सत्तर चल रहे थे जहां से सत्तर रूसी प्रतिभागियों की समर्पित है प्रोफेसर रोमिल थापार प्रोफेसर गणेश देवी जैसे माननीय प्रसिद्ध भारतीय विद्वानों के भाषण सुनते सुनते रूसी विश्वविद्यालय के प्रतिभागी अधिक प्रसन्न हुए थे उन्तीस या तीस नवंबर नम, को नवंबर को रूसी सत्र में विभिन्न विश्वविद्यालयों जैसे रूसी राज्य के मानविकी विश्वविद्यालय मास्को स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी सेंट पीटरबुर्ग स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी काजान फेडरल यूनिवर्सिटी स्कोव स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी विश्व अर्थव्यवस्था और अंतर्राष्ट्रीय संबंध संस्थान और अन्य विश्वविद्यालयों के रूसी प्रतिभागियों ने भाग लिया है हम शिव जी विश्वविद्यालय के सभी सहयोगियों को धन्यवाद देते हैं और भविष्य में ये निरंतर सहयोग के लिए अच्छी परंपरा के रूप में अपनी आशा व्यक्त करते हैं हम आपके वैज्ञानिक अनुसंधान में सफलता की कामना करते हैं जीवन के आनंद करके स्वस्थ रहे जय हिंद जय रूस धन्यवाद Thank you, Indira Gaziava, for helping in all possible ways to make this conference a great success. One of the co-conveners of this international symposium is Department of Marathi Shivaji University. Head of the department, Professor Randir Shinde, is a renowned scholar, writer, and critic in Marathi language and literature. I now request Professor Randir Shinde to present vote of thanks. professor shinde uh, good evening all of you respected guests of faculty function uh, kumar ketkar ji dr sharad nawre uh, the co organization of the international symposium dr megha pansare professor alexander stalarov and dr indira gaziava from russian state university for the humanity and the audience here we are uh, the conducting time of the three day interdisciplinary multilingual international symposium the contemporary dynamics of south asia 2022 the fourth symposium of the series open page of south asia i wish to say that this was a great experience for this for us the department of foreign languages and department of marathi shivaji university kolhapur the host uh, this symposium the symposium was held Uh, to commemorate the 50 years of the foundation of the department of foreign languages uh, india being a member of south asian
countries is concerned about many issues which were thoroughly discussed in the symposium, starting from history, geopolitics, uh, society, languages, literature, translation, gender, migration, humanities, challenges of ethic, pluralism, and culture diversity of multiculturalism, and so on. We are aware of the uh, limitation of this symposium. South Asia is a, a vast era to discuss in two and a half a days. Obviously, it was not possible to cover all that issues related with it. Uh, but we tried to invite some of the very honest, serious, sensitive thinkers, uh, intellectuals on the platform of the speak, apply about our concern. I must tell here that we are successful in this attempt. I wish to thank the uh, dignities of Russian Federation, Professor Vera Zabutkina and Dr. Elena Remiziva, who, who gave speeches in the inauguration ceremony. I wish to thank all eminent speakers, Professor Omila Thapar, Professor Prabhat Patnaik, Professor Ganesh Devi, Mr. Said Nakbi, Professor Urvashi Butalia, Professor Uma Chakravarti, uh, Sabha Nakbi, Ms. Salma, and Sonali Navangu, Mr. Jatin Desai, uh, Dr. Avinash Pandey, Dr. Parimal Maya Sudhakar, Dr. Detta Desai, Professor Said Hamid, Professor Sachin Ketkar, uh, Dr. Azra Sayyad, Parva Shafakat, Pro Professor Mahendra Lahoti, Dr. Taimur Rahman, Mr. Kushi Kabir, uh, Neil Amika Fernando, uh, Indira Rajan, Mr. Pratap Azbe, Mr. Vinit Tiwari, Advocate Mihir Desai, Mr. Kumar Ketkarji, Professor Shruti Tambe, Purva Naresh, Aramba Production Mumbai, Dr. Anga Bhatt. And I, th I, I thank to co coordination Dr. Indira Gaziava and Professor Alexander Stalirao Stoiko for their cooperation and support. I thank here all members of the advisory board and organized committee for their concert support organized this symposium. I also thank the technical team, especially Mr. Uh, Sahil Kalloli and Dr. Asiya Padalkar for always being their organized program without incorruption. I offer my thanks to the Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor and the Finance and Account Officer Shivaji University Kolhapur for making available the infrastructure and required services and the financial support to hold this symposium. I also thank the local and regional media published news about this international symposium. I thank the staff of department of Siva University Kolhapur and Russian universities. I also thank to congratulate all the participants who presented their research paper in the symposium. They will be given the certificates of participation. Due to COVID-19 pandemic, we had a shift to online mode to hail this symposium. I hope the pandemic will be over and soon the world will return to normalcy. Then we may plan to meet offline and take a symposium to a new step of discussion. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. With this, the three day international multidisciplinary symposium on contemporary dynamics of South Asia comes to an end. It was a pleasure meeting you all on this pl online platform and have an intellectual rendezvous with the who's who of the intelligentsia of and on South Asia. Looking forward to more intellectual interaction in future. Thank you. We, and uh, we are saying this company. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, Sahil, please recording stop. Karuga. Haan, jala se ah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Kumar Ketkar, sir.